That's what Charles always saying, do it. Do our own. You know, the, the state of mind you're in. And this is like really, you investigate in your mind, you know, like, know what's going on inside. Because, you know, usually our attention is outside, you know, going looking at things and, you know, we're conditioned to see the world as something out there. And, 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 that, and the thinking process tends to be, uh, you know, developed from that assumption. But then the Buddha, the point, not at making ultimate kind of doctrines about suffering, but is a noble truth, it's not ultimate truth. And so, the to see dukkha is not about going and looking at, 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 at misery outside, but looking here at your own on, on insecurity, doubting, uh, the feeling that arises when somebody insults you, or the feeling that arises when you get something you want is you feel momentary happiness, and, but it doesn't last. <laughs> and so you you know you, you can observe this, and this is like sati sampanya, sati panya. And you know that's the thing that so inspired me about this tradition. This is the only this is the only escape hatch we have. You know, how can you do it other, other way, just through believing in happiness or God or goodness that will make you happy? And, you know, if you're going to believe, it, you know, I encourage you to believe in good things, because <laughs> at least you'll find happiness, more happiness than you, the people that don't. Like if God is good and believing in angels and devadas and and uh, you know, seeing, trying to develop positive qual- personal qualities is certainly praiseworthy, but it it's limited. It's still birth and death. But I like it when it, just ask yourself: the unborn, uncreated. Can you? Your imagination, you can't produce anything, any image. Like if you notice in the, in Buddhism, you've got, you can produce a Buddha Rupa. So a human form, like here, a human form, uh, in a state of, you know, mindfulness, being aware. And uh, a Buddha Rupa is, is, is beautiful because it's a, a, the Buddha, Gautama the Buddha was a human being. He wasn't some Devana, an ethereal force from outer space. He's a physical, <laughs> historical human being. And, uh, and that, but he would, you know, he wasn't, that the Buddha is, is really just the enlightened conscious awareness. So, and then he, Buddha knows, re- recognizes, realizes Dhamma, the way things are, reality. You can't make an image of Dhamma. You can make a, like a Dhamma Jaka is the best you can do, but you can't have a human form for Dhamma. It's not impossible. So, you know, they have the Dhamma Jaka as a kind of symbol, remind you of Dhamma. And then imagine unborn, uncreated, unformed. Uh, and try to imagine anatta, no self. If I don't exist, there's no self, what am I doing, you know? And feel your mind kind of goes into, you know, trying to figure things out that that you can't, that where the, the reasoning, logical thinking mind can't reach, can't imagine, because it's beyond imagery. And, and like space is, is a beyond image or consciousness. And then nothing, the, the third immeasurable is uh, nothingness. You can't have uh, nothingness. That is a, is a 
in the present moment, or Nemasanya Nasanya Yatanang, when neither perception nor not. So try to figure that one out with your brain. It makes absolutely no sense on the logical, reasonable level. Neither perception nor non-perception. But intuitively it makes, it, you recognize it. It's an intuitive reality, not, not a logical one. And this is where, you know, you see the, the limitation of thinking takes you so far like Bariyati Dhamma, Bariyati Bhati Way, that sequence. Bariyati Dhamma is like signs pointing in a direction, you know. And uh, then you go where it's pointing, you do Bhati Bhata, and then the result of Bhati Bhata is Bhati Way, the result of what you've been doing. You can, so that it's, it's this, this formula of like the three aspects of each noble truth give you that sense of reflective awareness because it's not just grasping suffering as a doctrinal position you know, it isn't suffering, it's all misery and uh, it's, I mean, one can do that but that's not what a noble truth is uh, so the noble truth is is understanding suffering so like, use the, the suffering you have in daily life I used to tell people in England, I said, you know, being brought up as a Christian, you know, you you have these images of uh, Christ being crucified on a cross. That's a real strong image of suffering. I mean, you know, it was really extreme. You know, I stripped naked, humiliated, everybody laughing and jeering, nailed on a cross in public where your mother is, uh, you know, is at the base crying and 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 other people jeering and saying, You're the king of the Jews <laughs> and they put a crown of thorns and uh, hey, you know, it's the worst possible scenario for suffering or one of them. But uh, don't wait for a crucifixion, just work with the stuff you have in daily life. We suffer, you know, even if we're you know, in a beautiful modern wagon with all the luxuries around us and and then, you know we get our heat feelings hurt we we feel angry we feel desires and we feel frightened and envious and jealous and we worry and so forth and this is this is all the stuff you need to know and that's what well, you know what I what I've been doing you know like in uh, all these years just using the, the things that happen to me and you know, make me unhappy or angry or upset or despairing or whatever to just use that as a noble truth and hopefully I won't be crucified but if I am I wouldn't know what to do but you know how I could learn from that but uh, it's not necessary to wait for that time because none of us ever will probably be tortured or be used in such an extreme way. In uh, Thai first religion, there's a lot of opinions and views. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you hear Pete Monk saying, you've got to get to jhanas first before you can do vipassana, or, or uh, you know, it, or you don't need jhana, is there a waste of time, or, and, and so the people do grasp these words, and, and come from a position, an opinion, uh, and that, that but what you can know is when somebody says, you, you've got to get to jhanas first, how do you feel about that? When you know, do you agree or feel intimidated or what? This you can know, and, and to, to, to just to make it simple, you can only know how things affect you. Like, like some people come across the kind of 
authorities on the scriptures and you know they've studied Pali, Sanskrit and they, they've written books on the suttas and I mean when they speak from ex cathedra you know the high seat of certainty and, and their opinion I always found those people very intimidating <laughs> so so somebody comes from this kind of they have a degree in Buddhism and they, they speak in this very parliamentary style of you know find the authority and I use that looking at how my own reaction to such such strong conviction and certitude that they they push at me that I'm receiving like this. This you can know. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I mean how people present things also affects you. you know how I say something is going to affect my tone of voice. Is going to affect you. Your sensitive being, you know. Do I say something really profound, but in a harsh voice? You're going to feel the harshness. You may not get the, the profound meaning of what I'm saying. <laughs> this is what sensitivity is about. You know, this is a, this is a sense realm. We, we're not just, you know, you, you, you pick up like people's emotions. You know, the, you can say very profound things, but you have a very angry position, or, you know, this is the only truth and everything else is wrong. I mean, you know, that might be a tone of voice. You're going to feel it. We all will, but um, sometimes we, we, you know, we, we, we may not have that, con- that certitude, that certainty that they have. And then, then you tend to doubt that God is he really knows me. He's got a PhD and we just studied from Harvard University. I don't have anything. <laughs> and you can be aware of your intimidation. But that which is aware is what you need to respect rather than your view of yourself or of the, of the other person. Those are Sankaras. One question I have, I have uh, friends who are doing the same Buddhism and so other way of, other forms of Buddhism, and they often come with, with the, the question about, you know, it's selfish what we are doing, striving for Nibbana because they have so this uh, Bodhisattva idea in them. What is your, to this, this, you know, often you have uh, strong views in Theravada and Mahayana, even on this point. Well, that, that's very altruistic, you know, the Bodhisattva, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, it's very inspiring, in fact, you know, to sacrifice your enlightenment to the welfare. And I, uh, in one way, I kind of see how that's possible. I can't see how my remaining ignorant is going to help any of you. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> you know, I feel a lot of gratitude to Lung Kwan because he's, you know, I knew him, I lived with him, and he's a human being, you know, and the same problems as we all have, and, you know, he, you know, he was so helpful, and, and even to this day, he's, he's, uh, you know, even though he died 20 years ago, he, he's still the power of his teaching and the memory of him is still, you know, is, is even more so than it was when he was alive. And, uh, and he was compassionate. You know, because, uh, you know, I used to wonder, when you're running a monastery, you've always got issues and problems. And Wat Pong, well, as it started expanding, you know, it, it just, more and more monks came with more branches, and then there was more problems, and and scandals and things like this going on and and I used to wonder how he you know why didn't he why didn't he just go off and live a nice peaceful life instead of establishing what up home and and kind of accepting anybody that came and and then all us foreigners and, <laughs> and, and 
you know, because it, it, you know, in one way, you know, from a personal view, you know, why would he do such a thing, you know, when obviously probably lied and long before and he could have just lived a nice peaceful life some remote place. And then, uh, but then you feel this continuous this gratitude because he, he established what at home and, and opened possibilities for us all. And that's Bodhisattva. I mean, that's a, you know, an enlightened being who, who has compassion. Oh, thank you. And so I never I could see the point as I heard it from Mahayana, you know, I could see it as a Upaya maybe that developed too, because a lot of, some, sometimes the way we practice is so self-centered. Yeah, you. you know, like I, I'm going to get in line no matter what, man, to help with you. <laughs> <laughs> That they are. I mean, they, 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 so I can see the Bodhisattva thing as a kind of altruistic kumpaya to to kind of to kind of counteract selfishness. But uh, I'm I'm always what you know, what I've admired with the Theravada approach is this directness and clarity simplicity because that appeals to me I, you know I'm already you know my personality is quite complicated <laughs> I don't need to make it more complicated I just need to understand the causes of suffering why why I you know why I feel I feel this way. I used to want to know why do I feel like this, and then as the practice developed, then it uh, it wouldn't matter why. It's just, this moment is like this, and so like Lumpur Chaz always, it's like this. Life is like this, and and Buddha Tusk, you know, Benyam Me you know, the way things are, and uh, you notice this is a statement. Of reflection, it's not judging it, it's not saying it's good or bad this moment at this time, we're not saying it's good or bad or whatever, or but it's a, a certainly a acknowledgement that at this moment it's like this, and from your own, you know, awareness, not from your idea of what you like it to be, and, and from your own personal insight into your own feeling of opening to the present is like this. You know, because I can't tell you how it is. I can, you know, I can describe my own view of it, but it's probably not what your experience is, eh? See? So, that's where it's up to you to, you know, to, to, to recognize that you, you, you're the only one that can know at this moment the way it is. And then, you know, then it gets down to you know, there's consciousness, and then there's conditioned feelings of, that sometimes you have no name for. You know, a lot of our emotional life is, it, you have no words for it. You know, if you ask somebody, how do you feel right now? And then, probably, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, when you're really angry or greedy or something, that's stronger emotions, but most of our life is like this. It's neither nor. But, but we can be aware of it, neither nor. Without having to define it or examine it, just recognize all conditions, this, this continuous reflection on impermanence. And then, then investigating impermanence is, you know, accepting, observing, sati sampatanya, not making any problems around it, just a simple act of accepting this moment is like this. And then you, you, you recognize, you become more aware of the 
behind all the conditions you're feeling that the, the mental states or emotions or thoughts is consciousness and if you let go of your interest in the conditions that you're experiencing you realize pure consciousness here and now it's always pure you can't you know, the conditions can be endured, but the consciousness never into your heart. And that is quite important to me, because, you know, you're brought up in a Christian family where impurity is you've got to get rid of, and you shouldn't have impure thoughts or get angry or things like this, so you're, you're constantly trying to control things. And, and then feeling inadequate or guilty if you get obsessed with impure thoughts or anger and fear and jealousy and then you feel you know, you're not good enough or God doesn't love you anymore and so you know it's a hopeless task on that level is it how much control do you have over what lies in your consciousness can you only have pure, idealistic and beautiful thoughts and feelings or it changes according to conditions you know, what conditions now and, uh, and then uh, you know then it changes according to you know, you're going to this is one prop and it'll change and go to the side <laughs> where I'm changed rather than uh, you know this you can actually do, it's not about defining it or seeing it as good or bad, but recognizing it's like this. And that's a discerning, you discern, it's not a judgmental one. So even if you have bad thoughts or being angry, you can discern that anger is like this. You're looking at anger not by attaching to it anymore and uh, identifying with it is your problem but you're totally accepting it and then you see it cessation so anger is a permanent and not self so then you, you find this is this is reality and where before you know, you, you know oh I'm angry I shouldn't be and then you make a, a big thing about why do I get angry when I shouldn't and why am I so upset over somebody, you know, looked at me cross-eyed this morning and, you know, just really disturbed my peace of mind. <laughs> What's wrong with me? And then you start analyzing. Yeah, you know, don't do that. Just recognize conditioned phenomena like this. And then, then you can go, and that which is aware of conditioned phenomena can't be conditioned phenomena. Could be, but it's conscious, knowing. And like Munkacha, you know, he said uh, at the end of his teaching is all about my man not knowing. And that's what that's the highest knowledge is not I mean this is like a paradox really. It's not ignorance, like you don't know anything because you, you you know, you don't know why and you know, you're not you know, bright or intelligent and it's not giving up the intelligence but it's, it's transcending the conditioning <coughs> and knowing Dhamma you know Buddha knows Dhamma that's the real knowing because consciousness is the ability to know and the objects of consciousness are conditions are like the Sankaras. So, so that which is aware of Sankara is not a Sankara. And test it out. It's a, it's a kind of fun to do, I found. You, you know, you can be aware of anger. You know, if you're angry, then you say, oh, I'm angry. Oh, whose fault is it? Or I just lose my temper. Or I, you know, I shouldn't feel like this. And I've been a big you so long. And then you create a whole guilty trip in your mind about yourself as a person that having feelings that you shouldn't have. That's, you know, that's like a dictate operating. 
rather than the the opportunity of a moment is to observe the the kuto knowing tamo and kuda knowing tamo rather than emotional thoughts. <laughs> You know, like, like now it's so simple, you know, I've been practicing this for so long, you know, knowing, knowing some cars, you know, it's the best you can way to describe it. And be the knowing rather than the some cars. And that's my Sati Sampatanya. That's the, the gate to the deathless. And then, like, they, they, Aparita de Sangamatasa Tawa, the gate to the deathless is open. Amatasa, Amatasa Tawara, the door is a door, and Amatasa is like the gate, the door to the deathless. And that, that can't be a sankara, you know, it's, a, it's this, this point where we're mindful. You know, it's, it's, that's the escape hatch out of birth and death. 